Jesus for my family. I love that. As we declare over our households, over our loved ones, we want to see God's glory in this 2024. I think um, we're in a place where like, I'm tired of dealing with the same old stuff. Maybe that's not you, but year after year, it's the same old struggles, same old concerns. And uh, I think uh, in this 2024, we've got to declare, God, I am open for what you're doing. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I'm Andre Morell. Uh, I want to say hello to all of our guests that are in the room and everybody that's with us online. Let them guys, let them guys know you guys are in the room here. What's up, online people? Uh, I am here on behalf of our lead pastors who are on a cruise right now. It's funny, we, uh, they, they, they booked this cruise because me and some of the young adults booked the cruise in April. And so they were like, we want to go on a cruise. And I was like, well, you can't go with us because you guys are old heads. So it's only for young people. And that's me and the young people. So, so they couldn't go. So they went on their own cruise by themselves. So they left you here with me. Amen. <laughs> Well, I'm Audrey Morell, and I want to say welcome to all our people. Hey, when you came in, you should have been handed a Connect card, and on that card there's a couple of things we want you to fill out. Um, it, fill out as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. Let us know where we can pray for you and what we can help you on your next step in your journey of faith. Questions about faith, questions about the, the message. Uh, we want to interact with you and help you biblically on how to grow. So if you can fill that out, drop that off under the white tent and we've got a free gift for you uh, under the white tent as well. Hey, same thing for you guys that are with us online. Usually I'm with you in the chat. I won't be there because I'm speaking today, um, but let me know something in the chat. I'll see it later or just go to our website and fill out a connect card on our web website at unionhouston.com. We have the opportunity to bring all our tithe and offering unto the storehouse. And in this storehouse, in this temple that we bring our tithes and offerings to, the scripture says, God loves a cheerful giver. So it's time to give. It's time to give of our offerings to him because we know he can do more with the 10%. He can do more with the, so maybe even the sacrificial giving than when we hold on to it. And so today, uh, all the ways to give are on your screen. We are in a move, not just physically, um, at going to a new building, but we're in a move here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. But uh, as we are trusting in him more and more, I believe what we do when we give, we're obedient to him. We're able, we're opening ourselves to say, Lord, open the windows of heaven, pour out blessing. I won't have room enough to receive. He says he will pour it in, into your lap. It's promises that are in the scripture right there. It says he will do it and it will be pressed down, shaken together and running over. I don't know about you, but I think in this 2024, I need some running over <laughs> more than enough. And that's a promise from our God and he can do it. So let me pray over the families. Let me pray over households as you give. If you can, just, just you and God and you and your family. God, I thank you for every single person that's in the room under the sound of my voice, people that are with us online, Lord God. As they're obedient in giving, I pray a blessing over their household, over their finances, Lord God. God, this 2024, you're growing us in wisdom. You're growing us in knowledge of the secret things that you do, Lord God. The secret things that you speak to our hearts, Lord God. We don't want to be the same in whole life, Lord. Not just in one area, but in every area, Lord. So God, I bless their finances. Lord God, opportunities, doors open for them in the name of Jesus. And also in the name of Jesus, you will close the wrong doors. You're weeding out the wrong relationships and bringing the right relationships in, Lord God. Influence, Lord God. Opportunity, Lord God, that we rise higher, even in this economy, even in what's going on in our world, that your people rise higher. Elevation, glory to glory, strength to strength. We thank you for this, that we can declare this in your name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I do, as we are in this last week of 21 days of prayer and fasting, I hope you guys have been doing well. Some of y'all already confessed to me you broke your fast, so don't act up. 
the other day I ate a piece of candy and I was like, oh, oh, oh. no! Because <laughs> you know things are by habit and I had candy on my desk and you know, I was like, eh, I'm doing work. <laughs> I have sinned, oh God. Please stop. It's okay, it's okay. If you ever mess up, get, get back and try, try again. Amen? Amen. But, but I do want to give you uh, a little bit of encouragement, but some steps that's going to help us as we end this fast um, and, and, and hold on to a promise that God has for us. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says this, it says the thief has come only, <laughs> that means there's no other benefit <laughs> when the thief comes. He's come only to steal, kill, and destroy. Here's a promise. You know how I talk about promises from the Bible all the time? Here's a promise from Jesus. He says, I've come. <laughs> I've come that they may have life, you, he's talking about you, that you may have life and have it abundantly. You know what's kind of crazy is that uh, Jesus is not talking to dead people. <laughs> he's talking to alive people, people with blood flowing, heart beating, mind cognitive, everything. So it's just funny, he says that I've come that it, you might have life. Well, I've already got life, Lord. I'm already breathing. What more can you give? This is why he's saying life and life more abundantly. And I'm going to open that up for you guys in one second. But, but I, in, in order to have abundant life, I, I have some three things. Uh, and I call them three laws, but three guidances that, I, that I've kind of understood in life when it comes to obtaining this abundant life. And, and, the, and the first law, if, you, if you're going to take notes, this would be great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, the, the first law is the law of adjustments. The law of adjustments. If I'm unwilling to adjust, I will be unable to elevate. That's good. I can proclaim over you every week that you're going to go from glory to glory and strength to strength. But if you are unwilling to adjust, to be flexible in your life, you will be unable to elevate, <laughs> to go to the next level. I, 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 um, I'm reminded of a story in the Old Testament. Um, Naaman, he's a captain of the Syrian army, and he has leprosy. And, and back in the day, leprosy was like, you know, it's a plague to them. You, you don't touch that person. You don't go around that person. Life is over. So here he is desperately wanting to find healing. And somebody tells him, there's a prophet named Elisha, and you should probably go see him because I think he can help you. So, so Naaman goes, and he, in all his regalia, and all his prominence, goes to where Elisha is. And Elisha doesn't even go out and see him. He, Elisha tells one of his servants and says, hey, go tell him, Naaman, go tell Naaman to dip in the Jordan River seven times and he'll, he'll be healed of leprosy. It's so interesting that some of the easiest things we won't do just because we think, I don't really like that. See, the Jordan River is dirty. And the only people that bathe in the Jordan River is people, poor people. And so Naaman walks out disappointed and saying, what? I don't want to do that. Go dip myself in the dirtiest. It's like going to the bayou, y'all. Have, have you seen the bayou? Have y'all been downtown to see the bayou? And sometimes you think if they just clean this up, our city would look so much better. But if you ever, somebody said to go get healing, go dip yourself in the bayou, you'll probably be like, ew, no. <laughs> That's exactly what the Jordan River is. It's that dirty. <laughs> You know how they dredge the bayou every year and they find dead things all over the place? Cars. Cars. <laughs> Weapons that's been thrown out. <laughs> you know. So Naaman is in this place where he's like, I don't want to do that. But then a servant comes to him and says, if the prophet would have told you to do something hard, difficult, you would have done it. But here he's giving you something very simple. And you don't want to do it. 
I say it this way, we don't want what we say we want the way we need it. <laughs> the way we need it, we don't want it. Well, we say we want it, but you really don't. So we have to have, we got to be willing to adjust. Here's the second one. I call it the law of appetite. My elevation is determined by my actions, but my actions are a reflection of my appetite. Let me say that again. My elevation is determined by my actions. What I do is gonna determine my elevation, but my actions are a reflection of my appetite. God is the one that adjusts our appetite because he does it through exposure. Exposure, it awakens in us an appetite for something we didn't have an appetite previously for, but because we didn't know it was possible. Let, let me give you this example. Um, since we've been fasting, <clears throat> it seems like on my Instagram feed, all sorts of like new food spots been popping up. <laughs> and and there was a, there's a food spot out of this person's house, right? I, I don't know how, uh, you know, safe or good it is. Uh, well, I do know how good it is because they, they, they go outside and they give a testimony of all the people that are eating the food in the car. And they're like, oh my gosh, this food is so good. And, they, and the person's Instagram looks amazing. And I'm kind of like, and it's over in North Houston. I've been like, oh, when I get off this fast, I'm going to go over there and go to North Houston. And I think it's like a Louisiana like type thing. And she has this I, I can't even explain it. It's like a lobster, shrimp, mac and cheese, grilled cheese sandwich. Oh! I never knew I wanted a lobster and shrimp, grilled cheese, mac and cheese sandwich until I was exposed to it. <laughs> let, me, let, let, me, let me give you an example in the, in the scriptures. Jesus comes to the boat walking on the water. And Peter sees Jesus and really not sure what's going on, but he says, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come out to you. And he says, come on out. Peter jumps out the boat and starts walking on water. Do you ever think that Peter was like, you know what, I wonder, I've been a fisherman all my life and I think that I can walk on this water. No, he only thought of it that it was possible until he was exposed by the Savior, <laughs> that it's possible. Exposure grows our appetite, and God does that for us. Let me, let me say this really quick, really quick. Mismanaged exposure turns into jealousy and covetedness. We, we, <laughs> we, 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 we get exposed to things so much on social media that, that we start wanting what other people want, but that's not what God has for us. We, 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 we <laughs> in the pandemic, you, you was like thinking about starting a business of uh, candle making. <laughs> oh, I saw it. Oh, I think I can do that. Oh. We, we came up with stuff. We came up with crazy businesses, y'all. <laughs> because we were exposed to it. And what happens is we start, I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to do that. And we start wandering in the wrong direction. And sometimes we start coming what other people have. Well, I've been working hard. I don't know why I got the money they got. Come on, I, <laughs> let me, let me, uh, let me uh, tell on myself really quick. When I go to some of you guys' houses, and my, my young people notice, what, what do I do? I ask them what size their TV is. I have a 86 inch TV, and I cannot have you have a larger TV than me. <laughs> I, I'm working, the Lord is working on me, y'all. This is work, working on me. That's the first thing I do. I, I went over at uh, Christy and Jonathan's house, and I was like, hmm. That TV looks really big. And I started asking, what size is that TV? We, 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 we do that, and we start wanting stuff that is like, I, I've got a big TV. Why do I need another TV? So if you come to my house and I have a 90-inch TV, you know the Lord still is working on me. <laughs> but we start that mismanaged exposure. Sometimes we start going in the wrong direction and start going and having covenants over things that God does not want for us. And I ask you the question, what are you being exposed to in this January 2024? 
What are you being exposed to? We've been fasting and praying. Are you being exposed to God things, <laughs> Holy Spirit things, where it builds your passion? Or are you drained out and it's like, ah, I'm tired of this God thing. I, there was this mean that, that, that this uh, little black kid comes up and like a testimony. He's like, I'm tired of this church. And he just walks away. <laughs> and the whole church is like, oh, my God, oh, I'm tired of this church. I, I mean, there's sometimes we get drained, but I'm asking you, what do you have the appetite for? What are you exposed to and what is your appetite? What is your passion like in this 21 days of prayer and fasting in the first of this week? The Bible gives us exposure of many things that God is able to do. And it should build a passion in us, an appetite for us for those things. Here's the last one. Here's the last one. And we're going to get back into some worship. And then I'm going to come back. You're not done with me yet. This is what happens when you go out of town and go on a cruise. <laughs> uh, the third one. The law of agitation. I, I, um, God will create a divine dissatisfaction with what you have in order to create a desire for what you need. And, and, and what, what I mean by that, it's, a, it's like a holy discontent. Your purpose is created, your purpose is created to solve a problem. So sometimes we find ourselves aggravated in our environments or frustrated in our environments because we're not living in purpose. We're not living in a divine purpose of what God has for us. Let me, let me put it this way. <clears throat> uh, David and Goliath. David is a little boy and his parents make meals for David to go take to his brothers in battle. David goes to the camp to deliver some sandwiches and he hears this giant mocking God's people, mocking God and God's people. David hears this and he's looking around at the camp and he's like, y'all don't hear him talking? Y'all don't hear him yapping at these gums about y'all, about my, our God? And, and they're sitting around allowing Goliath and his people to do this. But David had an agitation. <laughs> he, he, he had a holy discontent that said, I cannot have this uncircumcised Philistine coming against God's people and his army. So David was the one that had a special, unique frustration, for he was the one to solve it. Sometimes if I'm frustrated, I got to understand, why am I frustrated? Lord, what are you trying to tell me? I am I in a place where I don't need to be, or am I in a place where I need to fix some problems? Because when God brings me to the scene, I'm here for a purpose. <laughs> I'm here for a reason. You're not at this church just to occupy space. You're not in life just to occupy space. You're here to solve a problem. And usually that problem starts with, that solving that problem starts with your kingdom come, your will be done in Houston, on earth, as it is in heaven. We've got to have an agitation. Frustration is an indication that God wants us to do something to fix the frustration. I go back to that John 10.10 10, that he says, I've come that you may have life and life more abundantly. And he's talking to people that have breath in their lungs. Well, I went back into the Greek in that and tried to dig into what the word Jesus is using. And really he's saying life as the creator intended. You don't know that life yet. Only Jesus does. He is from heaven that has come down to be with us, to give us that life. I can't give that life on my own. Why? I'm sinful. I ate a piece of candy. <laughs> but sometimes in your life, I've sinned. I've made mistakes. And I don't know how to get out of my situation. Well, great news. Jesus is giving life as the creator intended. A reboot 
a restart, and it's life more abundantly. Worship team, come back out. We're going to worship and just call on God. Holy Spirit, come into this place. If you can't stand on your feet really quick. Holy Spirit, come. Lord God, this 21 days of prayer, Lord God, we're not just fasting because it's a thing we do, because we are church people. God, we are seeking the greater. We're seeking the abundance. We're seeking life and life more abundantly. So God, I thank you, Lord God, we get to come to your throne. And Lord, that you hear us. You're not silent. You're not deaf to our voice. But God, you're actively listening and seeing us. I go back to the scripture all the time. Your promise says that your eyes go to and fro across the earth to find hearts committed. Well, Lord, we're here at 2800 Antoine. We're saying we're committed to you. The promise that you said in that scripture is that you will strengthen us. So bring strength down, healing down, deliverance down, Lord God. We don't want to be the same. We are pressing toward the mark, the goal of the high calling. We want this life, Lord. We want it more abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's continue to worship, worship team. Sit down real quick, sit down. Um, Michael, I do not have two hours and 34 minutes left. Um, let me know what time I've got. You know, you know I'm not going to take it all anyways. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I had to be like seven or eight. I can't remember how old I was at the time. But uh, at my grandmother's house, my, my, both my grandparents um, on both sides, my father and my mother, they lived close. My dad's parents live down the street on the corner of our property. We've got 40 acres of land, and on the corner of our property is my grandparents' uh, house and then my mom's parents they are down the street around the corner and um, the my school bus would drop me off at my mom's parents house and um, I would have to wait for my parents to get off work or one of my parents to get off work to come pick me up from grandma's house um, because my grandmother was a school teacher so she stayed after and so we would be at the house kind of by ourselves me and my sisters and um, sometimes I get bored and I just go outside and I just start playing Power Rangers it was hot at the time, or Batman, but I was really black man. I had, a, I had this thing, I was like, I can't be Batman because they're gonna know I'm black because of my mouth, you know, the mouth is exposed. So I was like, so I'm black man. I really did do that, I really, I was like, black man has arrived. <laughs> I really did that stuff as a kid. Uh, Lord, <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> But as I was playing outside, my grandmother had this along the driveway. It's a long driveway to the street, but along the driveway was these like posts, and on it was a grapevine. And I don't really know where she got this from. When I go home, I need to ask her because um, the grapes on that grapevine were just like it wasn't like the ones you got, get at the store. I believe they were wine grapes, which wine grapes are different. They're not the ones like you get at the store. They taste different. The texture on them is different. I remember I used to go there and pick them off, and it's just the sweetness and bitterness, because there's a bitterness to wine grapes, was just like, oh my gosh, this is really good. And I've seen my grandmother tend to this grapevine plenty of times, and I've seen her like cut away the leaves, the vines, and stuff like that. But I'm a kid, I don't know what she's doing. But I've seen her do this, and, and, and the, the leaves and stuff will be on the ground, because she's just cutting away so the vine can continue to grow. And me as a kid, I don't know, I, ha I got a stick and I'm like, I'm slicing at the leaves with a stick, being black man. <laughs> and I be here, ah, yeah, 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 you know? And um, a couple days later, a day later, my grandmother is furious, she's upset. And she's like, Andre, did you, did you tear up my grapevines and leaves? And I'm like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> because I went back to the house and the vine was dead. 
was dying thing, like it was, it, it, it really kind of lost life. And, and I, I think about that. In ignorance, I think I'm doing something that's the same that I saw. But, but you know, she's a master at understanding the vine enough. She knows where to cut. She's specific on where to cut. She's specific on where to cut back. That's too long because they can't grow there. And, and, our, and I've realized over time, this is just like our faith. Our faith, Christianity, starts with cutting, with, with, with death. <laughs> it, it starts with that. And, and I know if, if you're new to God and maybe you haven't made a decision for Jesus, I, I don't want that to scare you because salvation is free. It's easy. But the sanctification is where it's tough, yeah. if I'm honest. Hey, because we're not the thief on the cross. Well, we're about to die anyway. So, Lord, hey, take me to heaven with you. <laughs> Today you'll be with me in paradise. And, and he gets to go on to heaven, right? Because salvation is the assurance of heaven, right? But when we say yes to Jesus, we still got to live life here on this plane. <laughs> and that journey starts with cutting. I, 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 we're, we're all adults in the room, and um, I'm going to talk about something that <laughs> the prayer team already knows what I'm talking about. You know, I, I read through the Old Testament, and I'm trying to figure out why did God have a covenant, the sign of a covenant with Abraham by cutting the extra skin off his genitalia? I just, I, I was so flabbergasted by this like why, why would why is that the sign you choose now here's what I do know uh, culturally I think Hispanics do not cut their boys or widely Hispanics don't um, black people primarily yeah it's true uh, <laughs> I've got a lot of Hispanics friends more than you Alex uh, <laughs> uh, yes mo widely yes uh, I think Europeans, Euro Europeans, that it's not it's not a wide practice for them to be cut, be circumcised is is the is the word. And and I and I was battling with this because I, I was like, Lord, what is this? Like, this is such a gruesome, crazy thing you have your people do. And, and I always think about it like it's a sign for accountability. So you know what the Israelites could not do is marry people from other nations combine themselves. That's where it comes from unevenly yoked. Because they have a God that is not the God and when you marry and make a covenant with somebody that has a God that does not the God, you, that God becomes your God. Uh, I, <laughs> well, yeah. This is why we, we look at Samson the way we do. He, he, he had a Nazarite vow and, and, and he was commanded not to kalingo with the Philistine woman. And he finds himself over and over again wanting to be conquered, and he loses his purpose of what God placed him there for. This is why God said, you are my people. I've set you apart. You are wholly set apart. And, and, and I, I think about this as a circumcision is that. So when these things happen, they know, oh, you're an Israelite because you're cut. And still didn't really make a lot of sense to me. Why does God choose that sign? It's crazy. But then I started thinking about it is that for a male, it is the most sensitive part of his body. And what God wants to do is to take about three inches, which is not that much, and expose the sensitivity and bring the sensitivity in perpetuity. And that in itself is a reflection of what Christ is going to do in the New Testament. Is make us sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and as I look through this, I think of people that are maybe sensitive to the Holy Spirit at times. 
They're, they're able to pull back and expose that sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, but they're still fleshly, and that bad boy is going to hood right back up, and we become flesh again. <laughs> We're adults, guys. We're adults. <laughs> I, I, in my notes, I have like three ways to say that. And the way I just said it had the most question marks on it. <laughs> that bad boy goes hood up again. <laughs> but what I see, it, it is a wrestling of the flesh. Let, let, let's, let's think spiritually. We find ourselves being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We come in here and we have an experience, an exposure to the Holy Spirit, but we go back out and we become fleshly again. Oh, come on, if we're honest with ourselves, you've been petty this week. <laughs> come on, if we're honest with ourselves, we haven't been very forgiving. If we're honest with ourselves, we've been very carnal. Even in a fast where we're cutting back to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we still find ourselves back into the flesh. You see, you see how this revelation happens? Because I'm thinking to myself, Lord, what are you saying here? What are you trying to speak here? And I go to Colossians 2, 6, and, and, and Paul brings great clarity to all of this. There, as you receive Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that, you, that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. Don't allow that to happen, is what he's saying. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Here it is. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That means not a physical circumcision. So if you got that hood, you're good, okay? <laughs> you're good. It's like, am I like Goliath? Am I an uncircumcised Philistine? No, you're good. <laughs> by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism when we do baptisms that is the symbol of circumcision we are cutting back the flesh in order to come out sensitive to the Holy Spirit how do I know this what happens when Jesus was baptized when he came out the water. The heavens parted and the Holy Spirit revealed himself. That's what happens to us when we are born again. In which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. We've got to cut back. We've got to sometimes go through this heart circumcision often because our flesh comes back. And why do I say that? Because in fasting, it's easy to say that now. But three months from now, four months from now, sometimes we're going to be living very carnal because we're not at the beginning of the year where we're passionate about a new start, a new building. We're going to get in this building. There's going to be some work to get done. There's going to be some things to do. There's going to be things we need to work on. <laughs> and not just in the building, but in ourselves. As a community, as a people that grow in faith, we're going to have work to do. Listen, I, I see this all the time, is what happens in our physical is a reflection of what happens also in the spiritual. And, and, and if we even talk about the communion and union of man and woman, that is very God miracle. The inception of birth is a miracle that God has. When we enter into the holies of holies, it is exactly that. God is that the womb where we find life and life more abundantly in the Holy Spirit. This is why we say enter his gates. 
I've got to leave where I am to enter where he is. I, I think some of us, we, 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 want to, we want to play that revolving door. I'm in and I'm out. <laughs> I'm in and I'm out. I'm in and I'm out. But it says, enter his gates, dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what this 2024 is. I am committing to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So that means I've got to cut back the flesh. I've got, to, I've got to cut back everything that is not like God. The unlawfulness that I have in my life. Uh, maybe it is sexual immorality. Maybe it is my attitude. Maybe it is uh, my indulgence. Maybe it is my addictions. I've got to have passion to get free from these things because God has something greater for me. We've got to be passionate for that. It says in 1 Corinthians that our body doesn't belong to ourself. You were bought with a price. A sacrifice was made. And you were bought with a price. And that price, we pay it back by giving God glory. <clears throat> Let me read this from Joshua. I'm going to go back to the Old Testament really quick. <clears throat> Joshua 5 and 2. See, um, Moses is gone. And there's already been a promise for the Israelites to move into the promised land. Joshua, at this time, is grown. But if you've known anything about the story of Moses and the Israelites wandering in the wilderness for many years, um, there was a time they got to the area where the promised land is over there and they're not too far from it <laughs> so moses sends spies in to survey the land and joshua is one of those spies but he's young like a kid and he has a different perspective of what's in the land and how to overcome it than all the other spies he has a passion for what he's heard his whole life that there is a promise from god as they've been, he was probably born into the wilderness, and in that wilderness, all he's known. He's known that the generations before him were in slavery, but he knows that God has something ahead. And so here is this opportunity. They are at the precipice of a new building. They're not in it yet. They're at the precipice of it. And, 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 and this right here, Joshua is grown and he's led this army of people and they are about to move into this land. And so let me read this for you. At the time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made a flint knife and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gilbeth. Hara, I don't even know that word. <laughs> and this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war had died in the wilderness. Old generations gone. On the way after they had come out of Egypt, through all the people who came out had been circumcised. Yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come to, out of Egypt had not been circumcised. See, the law was on the eighth day of the, son, of the boy's birth, he was supposed to be circumcised. They had been in the wilderness for so long, they lost that tradition and that law. So you have a whole generation that does not have the sign of God's covenant. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of the war who came out of Egypt perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. That means they did not keep doing what God told them to do. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give to, to us. 
a land flowing with milk and honey. That means it's a beautiful land. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcision of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their place in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. That means the old. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal till this day. Here is, they're at the precipice of what God promised them generations and generations before. But the one thing, the sign of the covenant was keeping them from it. We're talking about three inches of skin. And, and, and I say it like that, but I really want you to maybe think of this. What in your life that this, this much flesh is keeping you out of God's promise? In that moment, Joshua understood that there was a generation of them that did not have the covenant. And right then and there, they fixed the problem. <laughs> because the passion was to get to the promised land. So I ask you the question, what is it that this much flesh is keeping you out of? I know we're fasting now, Lord. I'm, I'm starving myself to seek you more. But when we come out this flat, fast, it's only 21 days. What other fleshly things, this much, is keeping us from the promises of God, from the blessings of God, the freedom that we need, the abundance that we need, this life the way the Creator intended. This much flesh. You may say, Joy, what is this much flesh? My habits, my behaviors, my attitude. <laughs> That's a good one, my religion. My traditions, my will, what I want, me, 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 how I feel. And, I, and the reason why I'm, speak, I'm speaking this message, because this week I got pretty upset at something. Um, Ken is not here. I, I kind of vented to Kenneth and David, but you know, David is a car salesman now, so I don't see him much. He comes in at night with a suit, with a tie and a button up shirt, and I don't know this guy. I'm like, who are you? I'm trying to talk about APR and interest rates. Get out of my house. <laughs> the rates are down on a Mazda. Come and get this Mazda. Boy, if you don't get out of this house, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Ford man. <laughs> I'm a Ford man. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was talking to somebody because I actually, I actually know I was talking to you guys, Elsie and Kenneth, and I'm in our phone call. And remember, I said, "Okay, I'm done talking about that. Let's move on." <laughs> and, and I started thinking about it. Why, like, somebody said something about me, and I wasn't in the presence. <laughs> and, and 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 again, it's hearsay. I didn't hear it from the horse's mouth. So is hearsay. And I got upset about it and I called them because I'm like, I'm trying to get clarity on the situation. You know how, you know how this is when you get upset about something, somebody says something, but you call your friend and try to like, oh, what they thinking? No, no, blah, 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 We do that. We sit in our living rooms and we, we, we talk about like, well, I'm just trying to get clarity, but really we just gossiping about the situation. Oh, we do it, we do it, y'all. And, and, and where the conversations need to be had are not had, so what happens? Dissension enters in. Oh, I see this all the time as a pastor. We sit in meetings all the time, right, Susan? All the time, thinking about where did this dissension enter in? <laughs> it's because conversations haven't been had. We letting this much flesh. We letting this much flesh keep us from our unity. We let this much flesh keep us from God's promise. We let this much flesh because I got too much pride. So I, this message spoke to me because I'm like, man, Lord, like, I, and that's, I'm glad I was like, you know, we're done talking about it. And, and Elsie and Ken's like, that's right. Let's move on. <laughs> so I, I think that you have somebody that's measuring how much this much flesh you got <laughs> that's keeping you away from God's promise. 
I think this 21 days of prayer, we've got to be really good at understanding that I've still got this much flesh. Hey, I still got this much soul tie. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that relationship was a long time ago. But that relationship, this much relationship is still with me. For some reason, uh, that person texts or whatever, and I get pulled right back into that. I'm, 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 I'm bringing up scenarios that's this much flesh. We got to evaluate because in 2024, God had, listen, I, I do think some crazy things, this is an election year, some crazy things are about to pop off. <laughs> and some crazy people. <laughs> the last election, somebody was trying to kidnap the, the, the governor of Michigan. Like, <laughs> Like crazy stuff, right? And, you know, we, we talk about uh, turn on the TV and, and all these different things happening politically. Uh, and then now, what, what Texas, wants to, Texas wants to succeed from the union again, right? Over immigration. We about to get in some wild stuff. And here's what we about to get wild in. Your conversations with your friends about to get wild. <laughs> this much flesh. That's when, we, that's when we enter the flesh back in. And we're about to enter that into this year. But God wants to do something different with us. God wants to do something greater with us. So we've got to continue to evaluate. Hey, if there needs to be a fast throughout the year, fast. Don't wait to a corporate fast. Because it's like, Lord, I'm allowing f- flesh in. I need to, uh, let me cut this off because I need to CQ on this, Lord. We don't need to be afraid to go to a prayer closet and pray. And when I say a prayer closet, you ain't got to go actually into your closet. I mean, I have a pretty large closet, so that's where I go. But you can go to your room, tell the kids to get out, like, you know, go to a space. This is my space where I can seek God. We need to find that for ourselves. We've got so much going on in our lives, so much noise. We've got to be able to cut back. We've got to prune. And it's a continual process. The circumcision of the heart. Worship team, come on up. You guys come straight up right here. And I'm going to, well, you guys go get your mics. Sorry, I didn't plan this very well. Sorry. <laughs> hey, we're going to have a moment of prayer in, in this place. The prayer partner's going to come up, and I get it. I know when I, I, I give you a, a parameter of what this much flesh is, and to maybe, I, I have this phrase. Elsie um, and Kenneth know this. My, the kids know this. I think, Jalen, I say it to you all the time, right? Everybody's much is much. So I can look at situations, and I may tell Mike, Mike, what you're going through ain't that big of a deal. I like get over it. But to Mike, it's a big deal. <laughs> and everybody's much is much. So I don't want to dilute what this much flesh has a stronghold in your life. This is why we're the church. This is why we come here. Because this much flesh may have years of holding on us. We can't get rid of it. It's a reoccurring thing that comes back and back and back and back again. This is why we intercede for you up here in the front. This is why when you send your prayer request in throughout the week, our prayer team, myself and the pastors, are praying for you. Because we believe the power of prayer is that it can shake any false foundation you've got and set you free. So we're going to go into a moment of prayer as we get into this last week of fasting and praying. But before I do that, just everybody bow your heads and close your eyes really quick. I know I've been talking to really people that have said yes to Jesus, but I don't want to miss out on people that maybe have not said yes and said, you know what? I don't know if I have that assurance of heaven that you were talking about, Dre. And I'm not asking you to move in fear or in the fear of hell or anything like that. I'm not fire and brimstone, but there's a God that loves you. There's a savior that has already paid the price so that you can have freedom and that you can have life and life more abundantly. Don't you want that? You've been spinning your wheels year after year after year. And there is one yes that is gonna move you and begin to start something in you that's gonna change the rest of your life. So if that's you, I know God can see you, God knows your heart, but if that's you, I need you to just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. This day, I want you in my life. I've got to have you. God, I believe that you died, buried, and you rose again. You defeated death, hell, and the grave for my freedom, for my abundant life. And fill me today 
in Jesus' name. Amen. That's salvation. It's easy. Now the sanctification part starts. What are we cutting back? What are we cutting back? And I'm not talking about just our fasting. I'm talking about what behaviors, what habits, what things we find ourselves doing that is so natural to us. Listen, I, I heard this, this, this quote, sacrifice isn't sacrifice until it feels like it. <laughs> sacrifice isn't sacrifice until it feels like it. When we start to cut, you should be able to feel the cut. Ah, what I used to do, I used to have the habit, oh, it's tough, like when, our, when we're fasting. You know, we're not cognitive of it, like, you know, me eating that piece of candy, you know what I'm saying? When we're really kind of starving our body, we, we can feel the sacrifice. Well, sanctification is that. But once we learn how to start sacrificing, we're adjusting the way our flesh desires. Our spirits become stronger. We're circumcising the heart so that we're exposing the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Amen, church? Let's stand on our feet. I want to end a little bit early because I want the prayer partners to have time to pray as we enter into this last week of 21 days of prayer and fasting. God is revealing something to you. Don't neglect it. Don't turn away from it. He's doing something in you. He wants to do something far greater than you can think or imagine. Surrender to him today. Begin to cut back. Begin to say, maybe I don't know what it is to cut back. Lord, show me what it is I need to cut back. What is it where I need to circumcise the heart, Lord? Show me, because I want to have the covenant that you have with me, the blessings you have with me. Prayer partners will be up here. We're going to silently dismiss, because I want people to be able to have time for prayer. But if you need prayer, come on up. Don't be afraid. But until then, I want to say, God bless you. May his face shine upon you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. God bless you. I'll see you next week.